Come, Holy Spirit. Come and fill the hearts of your people. Kindle in us the fire of your love. That we might burn for you when we are within the community. And that others may be drawn to you through us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be comfortable. <clears throat> Recently, I've been having conversations with um, um, with the church somewhere in Melbourne with some young people that are are a part of that church there, and apparently, according to their structure. Um, when you come new to that church, you go through a whole kind of teaching program and then you have an exam at the end and you pass the exam and graduate into the congregation and stuff. And I've, I've been having that conversation and I was meeting I was meeting up with them this week again because I was invited to be a part of, of this Bible study. And the motive behind all of that's been rather interesting because the church in Korea was being accused by other pastors in South Korea of being um, a cult. And because in South Korea, the coronavirus started within this particular church, which was rather interesting. And, and it was purely accidental. It, it wasn't anything deliberate or anything like that. But it, I mean, it did start there. But um, um, and, and, and so there's, there was this conversation taking place with the pastors to try and help them. The, 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 the head pastor of that church was trying to help the other pastors understand that he was one of them and he wasn't a cult and all that kind of stuff. But I'm kind of thinking, you know, I don't know what you think about defines a cult. And for me, it's got nothing to do with, with what people believe. It's got to do with control, it seems to me. And, but if you're controlling what people believe, then it becomes problematic. And I'm getting hints of that going on in these conversations I'm having with these young people, which is disturbing me some. And I'm not quite sure whether that's influencing what I was thinking about this week or whether that what happened this week is fitting in with what I was thinking about in terms of the scriptures. Because one of my favourite sayings, one of the sayings I constantly tell myself is this, I'm not saved by being right. I am not saved by being right. How I interpret scripture, what I preach on, is to hopefully to try and get you to, to think, not to say that you have to agree with what I say, because I'm not saved by being right. I don't have all, this might surprise you, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything there is to know about God. Does that surprise you? Shake your head, please, because I'm in trouble if you're going. <laughs> My salvation is not dependent on me knowing everything there is, everything that God knows. In fact, I would go as far as to say that's what damaged the relationship between humans and God in the very beginning. If you go to Genesis 3, what was the outcome? They wanted to, to be like God. They wanted to know the difference between good and evil. So I, can't, I have to keep reminding myself of this fact. I am not saved by being right. Speak, particularly when uh, there is a startling error in the worship service, when there are spelling mistakes, um, where there's wrong numbers on the hymn boards, which happens sometimes because I think I've got a numerical dyslexia, where I choose the wrong hymn to go with the words that people don't know, where there are technical failures. I use this to counter a disabling expectation of myself to be perfect. I am not saved by being right. I began thinking about that in terms of culture. It's so easy for us to have that understanding that um, our culture is Christian culture. Yeah. Well, if you believe that, we need to do some serious talking. 
I, I learned that when I was in Papua New Guinea. Um, there in my early 20s, I attended the patronal festival of St. Peter in the Anglican Church of St. Peter in Ley. And this big bare-breasted Mary, which means, uh, means woman, danced the Bible down the center aisle. No one else was disturbed. No one else was shocked. No one else was appalled, or in my case, a little more than a teenage boy, also enthralled. <laughs> this was a perfectly normal, cultural, natural to those who were present. And I found myself reflecting on what we meant culturally by dressing modestly. On our attitude towards nudity and our difference within culture, asking the question, well, whose culture is right? Well, the answer is none. None are right. Except one, of course. And if you haven't heard me talking about the culture of the kingdom of God, which we as Christians should aspire to, that's another story, but that's another sermon, or that has been another sermon over and over and over again. For example, in our we have a culture within our Anglican church with various rites and traditions that, that we observe in our Anglican liturgical practice. Things like lighting the candles on the altar. How many candles are there on the altar? Two. Why are there two? There's one on each side. <laughs> it's about balance. Yes. <laughs> Symmetry. Because it disturbs those of us who have got a J-type personality to have things askew. But there is, this, there is this thing that says the gospel candle should never burn alone. Has anyone heard that? Yes. The gospel candle should never burn alone. And that, that is treated by some people as if it's a kind of a law. And I've often responded to those who insist on compliance by asking them this question, which candle is the gospel candle? <laughs> that one, is it? Oh, How do you know? Because it's when you walk first. See, and, that, and there's a common response. This is the one that I was told was the gospel candle. It's burning away. Don't? It's burning away. It's the first one. No, it's really interesting, isn't it? We've got in this complete discussion about this whole kind of sense of which one's the gospel candle. Well, my understanding of which one's the gospel candle is the one which, which is closest to the place where the gospel is proclaimed, which would be the one here on the left. Ah, who cares? Is that going to destroy... God's relationship with you because you light the wrong candle, because you don't know all that kind of stuff. Now, then the, let me just sort of say, you know, there, there is something sacramental about those rites that sort of remind us of everything that we do, everything that we have is sacramental in nature to remind us of something. Even stained glass windows, they're the cartoons for those people who can't read. You People back in the days who couldn't read would know exactly which saints were up there on that in that window, or you would have those pictures of gospel stories that are placed in in the candles in the in the windows. Our rites and our customs are worthy of sacramental purpose. That it's not going to destroy our relationship with God if we fail the custom or don't know the custom. Why? Because we're not saved by being right. What are we saved by? Grace. We're saved by <clears throat> becoming who God intended us to be in relationship with God that Jesus made possible. That Jesus made possible through his life, death, Resurrection, and you might want to add ascension on there as well, which is why I add those words in, in our service where it says, you know, died. No, there's more than that. It's life, death, and resurrection. Christianity is not about having all the right answers, doing the right thing, being the right, being right living, that is, moral person. It's not even about doing what we need to do in order to be in right relationship with God. It's about accepting 
that God has declared us to be right with him through Jesus Christ. And that ought to inspire us in what we do. Last week, I spoke about the need to value those who are not yet members of our congregations. And I reminded us of the words of that previous Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael Ramsey, who said, the church is the only organization that exists for those who are not its members. And here in this letter to the church in Rome, Paul is effectively saying the church is the only organization that does not expect everyone to think and be the same. Let's hear those words. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling, quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. And today we are reminded that we need to value those who are and will be members of our congregations who are not members, but when they become members, they are not going to be strong in their faith. Consequently, we must also value those who are needing to grow in their knowledge and love of God. Now, there are some different, differing opinions regarding who are the weak in faith in Paul's letter. Is it the Jews or the Gentile Christians, the Gentile believers? At first, we may think it's the Jewish heritage believers who are holding power over the Gentiles because they are not holding on to the traditions of the Lord of Judaism. Certainly holding one day better than another while other judge all the days to be alike may suggest an argument regarding the Sabbath and Sunday or any day for rest may su suggest this argument. However, Paul's acknowledgement that some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables, reminding us of Peter's experience in Joppa, declaring all things to be eaten as clean. That suggests the Gentile believers are those who are in a position of strength. And I find myself falling in favour of the understanding that it is the Gentiles who are the ones Paul has in mind who are in the position of strength. And the Jewish heritage believers are those who are weaker in faith. Whenever we make rules and laws and expectations that everything should be done in the same way and everybody do the same thing, then we are weak in faith. Because the, they are, we are operating on the basis of rules, rights and traditions rather than faith. And the faith means to trust, to trust in God's grace and in this case, of course, as Paul is talking about, to give freedom. To give freedom. As we look and work toward what we have to be, to enable God to bring growth to our congregations and parish, we need to be conscious that there always will be a group of people who are weak in faith. The problem is we tend to think about ourselves and where we are and forget about those people who need to be nurtured, that come in behind us. We focus on ourselves. And we haven't been good at nurturing the faith of those even who are already present. We certainly forget to look to those who would come behind us who God is drawn to himself through us who will have no faith at all and need to be nurtured. Welcome them, those who are weak in faith too, and do not quarrel with them because they do not know, because they do not understand. They come with other thinking and experience. Don't do the right thing. Don't use the right words. Simply do things differently. I know as a young person coming to faith that I tended to have some kind of syncretistic understanding of God and you know, was drawing in stuff from all over the place, I guess, in terms of making up my own way of expressing stuff. And that's going to be the reality of the people that we come across, living in that supermarket spirituality that we have present in our society nowadays. I 
I don't know about you. Do you sometimes feel a little intimidated by those who are vegans, like they're superior because we're eating ethically? Well, I do. Or even vegetarians. Or those who don't drink alcohol. And those who drive fully electric cars <coughs> make me feel weak. But it's also a world that we live in with great diversity. And I am conscious of this, having visited a Christian church of a different culture, and the congregation removed their shoes at the door when attending worship in the church. So to any level of faith in the midst of diversity, Paul says this, let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. One of those things we must be conscious of as we strive to be a church that enables God to grow is not to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of others responding to God, persuading them to come to him through us. That includes simple things like signage. Where do you go? Not having signage is a stumbling block. I can tell you that not having nice toilets is a stumbling block too. In one of my previous parishes, it was literally a pit toilet outside the church. I made sure that I went to the toilet before I went to that church. But also expectations that they're going to know stuff. They've got expectations of what happens here. Expectations of my role. All those sorts of things can be stumbling blocks or lack of knowledge that helps them to be a part and make space for them to be nurtured. We must make sure that there's nothing getting in the way of anyone finding faith and growing in faith with us as God draws them. And let's to acknowledge our own diversity as a parish with all the complications, all the tensions, all the conflicts that diversity may sometimes bring. Now, let me say that's natural. Those things are always going to occur when you acknowledge and accept diversity. But we need to also acknowledge the diversity of those who God will draw to himself through us and acknowledge that that too will change who we are as a faith community and perhaps even change the way that we do things. But we're not interested in making clones. It's hard enough living with me, let alone if everybody was like me. What a nightmare. <laughs> I half expected Frida to say that one quite, quite loudly. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> Everyone heard that one. But to create people who are responding out of, of what they understand where they are now in who God is, in their desire to honour the Lord, Persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it's unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. If you think it's unclean, if you think you should be a vegan, then go for it. Not me. If you think you should be a vegetarian, then my budget says, yeah, they're going to do that some of the nights of the week. <laughs> Meat's way, way too expensive. If you think you should not drink alcohol, go for it. Well, I'm not there yet. I don't want to be there yet. Thank you very much. A church with a culture of growth recognizes diversity, including diversity of levels of faith. We must not forget that we need to always nurture faith in one another and those who God draws to himself through us. That all may know the grace of God, which does what? Gives perfect freedom. Let us pray. 
God of mission, who alone brings growth to your church, send your Holy Spirit to give planning to our vision, direction to our goals, wisdom to our actions, love to our nurturing faith, joy to our worship, and power to our witness. Help our church to grow in spiritual commitment to you, grow in service to our community, and grow in numbers. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.